Well, good morning. My name is Mike, and I am one of the leaders here at Risen City, and, and truly am one of the leaders. Um, we have a great team that make up Risen City and make it happen, and so I just want to take a special moment today just to thank every single volunteer and leader in our church, from the worship team to the setup team to the kids team to the tech team at the back. If you're part of our church and you're helping us out, can I just say thank you to you from, from my heart to you, because if you guys weren't part of it, we would not be doing church right now, and so thank you for, for doing that. Thank you for being here and being part of what we're doing. If this is your first time at Risen City today. Maybe it's your first time in church in a while. Maybe it's your first time in church ever. Um, I want to say a special welcome to you today because you are part of the reason why we do church. In fact, we, will, we, we want to be a church that helps like real people like you meet the real Jesus in, in, in the middle of, let's be honest, sort of real life situations. Because we all got them. Right? No one walks in this room perfect and put together. Right? We have our mess and our issues. But, but, we, but, but thanks be to God that we have a real Savior for a real problem. And, and, and Jesus is that. And as a church, the way, the way we say it is that we want to be, be a church that leads people into a soul-changing relationship with Jesus. Because for us, God is not some idea, it's not some philosophy that we follow, but a person to be known in relationship with, to go deeper with, to, to get to understand and to encounter. And as a church, it, it is our goal not to just create moments uh, of, of religious service and, and ritual and just do this thing that sort of just allows us to feel like we checked off our spiritual thing during the week, but to create moments of genuine encounter with Jesus that actually leads to life change. Because we believe that when you actually meet the God, the universe who formed us and made us, things happen in us. Jesus calls it rebirth, that we get remade and become a new creation. The old passes away, that we actually see see God heal some of the wounds and fix some of the issues and forgive the sins of our heart and, and give us a new life. And so that's what we're chasing here today. And, you know, as a Christian, one of the ways that we do that is through this thing called the Bible. And if you're unfamiliar with the Bible, um, we don't believe that, that the words in this, this thing are just some old, ancient relic that means nothing to modern life. We, we believe this is a good word from our good God for the, for the good of our soul, that he gives us his word to lead us to ultimate flourishing, that if we follow Jesus, we're doing so because he promises us a couple things, life, joy, fullness, right? And we want to find those things. And so we become apprentices or learners of life from the one who, who made life, the author of it, Jesus, and allow his word to speak to us to do that. And so we're going to do that today a little bit. And, and we are going to be in the book of Micah. If you have a Bible, if you want to open up to the book of Micah, if you don't have a Bible or, or phone or something, uh, if you do have a phone, you can access the Bible. There's so many apps now you can get, and we invite you to do that. But we will have it on the screen in just a moment. And, and, and if you're unfamiliar with the Bible, the book of Micah is found in what we as Christians call the Old Testament. It's part of the Bible that is sort of uh, chronicles the history of the people of Israel but that, that God uses, uh, not because they're awesome, not because they're wonderful, but in fact because they're weak and small, he even says, to display his own nature and character. That he uses this kind of broken and, and messed up and messy people to show how faithful he is and how good he is. And it ultimately points towards Jesus, that he's the fulfillment of. And so we, we read as Christians the Old Testament, we're reading back from the lens of Jesus who we meet in, in the New Testament. And so Micah Chapter 6 is, is, is sort of a famous Christian uh, verse. Like, like Christians, I don't, we don't always like to admit this, but, but we like parts of the Bible better than other parts. I, I, I don't know if you realize that, but some of us like certain passages and certain parts of the Bible. Though we know we should love the whole thing, there's certain ones that just feel easy to us, that sound good and preach real nice. And so we like those ones. But it's kind of like if you have more than one kid. And, 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 and you know you got to love all your kids, but sometimes you like one more than the other because it acts better, right? You know you shouldn't. You feel sort of guilty, but it's like this is just what it is. But we don't want to have that with the Bible, right? We want to love it all because I've found that we often like parts of the Bible that we don't think deeply enough about. Because although it might sound good, it requires much of us. And so we're going to dig into Micah chapter 6 a little bit today, starting, um, I think I have it in verse 7. I don't really remember what I, what I put up there. I'm going to check. Verse 6, that's what it was, verse 6. And we're just going to get through this and see where we go. And, you know, if we got a couple hours, hey, good being with you today. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give you my firstborn for the transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? And here's that famous verse, verse 8. He has told you, O man or mankind, what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love 
kindness, or you could translate that mercy, grace, love, in fact, the hesed of God. We'll get there in a moment. So to love love and to walk humbly with your God. To do justice, to love love, and to walk humbly with your God. Jesus, we do thank you for your word again. We thank you that you are going to speak to us through it today. I pray, God, right now in the beginning of this sermon that you would be the one um, in control the next few minutes. God, if there's anything in Mike that is uh, not of you, any, anything that I thought was, was clever or, or cruel or cute, God, that's not for our church, I pray you would just destroy it in my mind. Let it not pass my lips, Jesus. We want this to be fully from you to us, God. We want to be a church that comes underneath your word and receives with joy what you have. And so I pray that I will not speak outside of that. I pray, God, that you will give me grace for, 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 for the sin that's in my life that doesn't allow me to speak perfectly in this moment. God, I pray that you would take the gifts you have given me to steward and that you, God, would use them for the good of our church, for the glory of your name right now. Would you pray this in your glorious and good name, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Have you ever noticed that uh, fall is kind of a weird season? Right? Like, 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 I don't know if you noticed this before, but like, I love fall. Fall is good with me. I'm all about it. I like the sweaters. I like the, the, the drinks, apple ciders, nice pumpkin picking. All that stuff is great. But, 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 you know, if you think about it, it's kind of weird, right? We celebrate the death of something because it's pretty. Right? Like, like imagine someone comes up to you and says, you know what? I really like watching the slow death of this thing as it turns color, and I'm going to take pictures of it. You would think they're crazy. Let's be real. If someone walked up to you to say, I, I'm not going to use an example. I just had one, but I'll use it. Why not? Imagine someone comes up to you and says, hey, I really like watching bunnies die real slowly and take pictures of it to chronicle the colors that it changes. Right? You'd be like, you're never going around my children. Right? That's what we'd be. But when it comes to trees, right, it's like, I want to take a, I want to capture the moment as this tree slowly dies because it's pretty to me. It's a weird moment. Right? We don't often think much about it. But, but I found that, that, that we just got to think, you know, sometimes, just be honest, we are morbid people at times. Right? But you know what else is funny about fall? Some people treat it like New Year's. Ever notice this as well? Right? It's almost like, like culturally a, a three-quarter New Year's opportunity. We, we come back after the, the, the summer, we're relaxed, and it's fall again, so we're going back to school, some of us, going back to the new rhythm of work. Right, Everyone's feeling good because the temperature is awesome. Well, not today. It's like 30 degrees outside, but generally fall is good like that. And we also have this moment sort of to reset. Right, like I want to be, be better this time around, this season, because I know we say New Year's is really January, but let's be honest. Let, like New Year's is September. That's how the calendar really should should be made. We should have New Year's parties after Labor Day. Why not? Right? As a church, it's a new rule. Every Labor Day, New Year's party. That's what's going to happen, right? But we come back, and, and some of us will think, you know, I'm going to be more, more productive at work this year. So I, I want to be better with my time, better with my calendar. I want to be better with my body, maybe. Work out, actually, this time around. Or, or I want to, you know, do more, uh, do, do, do more work at school. Some of the students looking back at last year thinking, you know, this year I'm not going to be a procrastinator, right? This is the year I'm going to put my studies first, said every, right, C student every single year that they're in school. Because, you know, Cs get degrees, apparently. But I'm just saying, right, just because you're lazy and you get a degree doesn't make it good. It's putting out there. Someone's got to say, if you're going to be in school, we're, we're going to get there in a moment. I'm bring, bring, bring it back up. Here's the thing. Here's the thing I found. As much as, as we can appreciate wanting to improve this next season, right, and hopefully that you do, um, if we improve sort of in the wrong things, it's not actually improvement, right? Like, like if we succeed in the wrong areas, it's just failure covered up in some achievement. Right? And, 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 and this is the thing that, that maybe the question is not, how do I improve on some of these little issues? It's maybe how do I improve on ultimate things? Because the ultimate things always then, then sort of penetrate into all the little things in, in my life. And see, this is actually where Jesus brings us. He, he begins to question some of the deepest things of who we are and why we do what we do and where are we going and what are the chief aims of my life? Because if we can see that every area that I might want to improve from marriage to work to studies to leisure to money to, to sex to Everything actually gets implicated by Jesus and his change of our ultimate aims in life. And this is where the tension of following Jesus actually comes full circle for a lot of people because we sort of like the idea of Jesus and how he you know, saves us and his grace and his love and his mercy. It's wonderful. But then he begins wanting to infect every part of our life. 
that there's, that there, there's nothing off limits to him. In fact, that he comes in and begins trying to define and redefine and, and qualify our money and our marriage and our family and sex and politics and, and religion, all these different parts of us. He, he's almost like, like a good version of a mother-in-law that you invite over. You know what I'm saying, right? The mother-in-law, you invite her over, and you're trying to hide all the dirt and put all things away, but somehow she gets into everything and points it out. Your wife feels bad, and you got to do this whole thing again, right? But he's the better version of that, where he goes in, it's a, cleans it all up, and it's wonderful. But here's the problem. Here's the problem. It often means, it often means that, that we have to begin shifting the way we see things. And we don't always like that. That, that, that we are called to, to live in this world that, that we live in, sort of in it and in, in, in with it, but, but very different from it. That there are some things that Jesus wants us to see and put into our life that, that if we can do that, it actually begins to affect every part of how you and I go about our day. That whether you're at work, at home, whether you're playing or out doing basketball or whatever it might be, all of a sudden, Jesus implies and implicates some things for our life. And what we begin to see in, in Micah is, is, is three things, three ultimate aims that Jesus wants us to, to work on. That if we do this, I want, you, I want to make sure that I say this very clearly, that if we can follow him in this way, you will discover what being human actually is. And that's how, how big this is. Right, that when Jesus begins to focus in on us and change us, we actually discover what it, what it, what it means to actually be fully alive. Because that's the claim of, of Christianity, by the way, that, that before meeting Jesus, you're not fully human yet. You're not fully living yet, that there's something that needs to be fixed and put back. And in, in Micah, we, we begin to see three things that Jesus sort of says to us, a grid for our life, that I believe if you can get, your marriage will get better. Your family will get better. Your productivity is going to get better. Your life will get better. Maybe not easier. Actually, it won't definitely get easier, but it will get better. So I want to track with you here today, all right? So Micah chapter 6, it's this interesting portion of Scripture because it starts, if you have like a Bible where, where it labels some of these things, it comes right after a section where, where God is indicting his people. If you don't know what that means, it means God is judging them. And I know that we don't like talking about God being a judging God, but the nature of God's heart for loving his creation means that he must rid his creation of, of all evil. The problem is evil gets perpetuated most often through people, through us, that we are selfish and greedy and, and lustful and just passively and actively allowing things to happen in our life that, that are against what is good and, and right. And we often live in this space, but because God is actually a God who loves what he has made, his desire is to get rid of that which is evil, which puts us at a weird spot because that means his justice and love is aimed at us. And luckily we got Jesus, and we're going to get there in a few moments. But his people aren't acting as if this is true. They're, they're acting in a way, and in fact, in this specific case, he's calling them out for this false religious idea that they are people who basically come and they do these big religious ceremonies and services and have these big sacrifices. Because at the time, the system of relating to, to a God was through sacrifice that you would give a, a ram or a bull or a pigeon or even some flour, whatever you had according to your means to show your, your, your contrition. And these people would come and they would make these big sacrifices and big displays and then go live as if it didn't matter at all. Oppress people, allow injustice to reign, sort of not allow God to infect their every part of life. And, and Mike is writing to them and saying, God is, is done with these games. He's, he's, he's not about this whole, you can come to church and pray some prayers and think that that's enough kind of religion, because what religion begins to do, w w whether you are a Buddhist, an atheist, or, or a Christian, or a Jew, or it doesn't really matter your religious background. The religious heart is the same. Whether you have a God attached to it or not, it's this. I don't actually have to be a good person if I can do a lot of good things that outweigh the bad ones. There's this kind of karmic balance stuff that we often fall into because it just sort of takes the pressure off. I'll, I'll do some bad stuff throughout the week, but like on Sunday morning, I'm going to lift my hands, pray, cry a bunch, and listen, amen, the pastor and God must be okay with me then. And God's like, I'm not about that. That's not how I operate. I've come to actually destroy this kind of religion that we often fall into. And, and Micah goes on to say in, in Micah chapter 6, even to the point, and this is pretty crazy, that, that, that if I were to give my own son, for my transgressions. God, see how serious I am about this, how much I really love you and sacrifice. I would even sacrifice my own kid, which is a little crazy, but it was actually a practice in the ancient world that the God of the Bible called unjust and stopped because it wasn't awesome, obviously. And I don't know what happened to that kid because, like, I've been mad at my children before, but, like, Never to the point of, I think I want to sacrifice you today. Like, like that, that, there's got to be something that happened there. Didn't sleep that night, had accidents. Some happened where the dad woke up and was like, man, you're done. But um, either way, not good, right? Doesn't matter how serious that you think you are. He's like, God, I'm not about this. And then Micah says, so, so what is God actually chasing? 
What is God after? And then we come to verse 8 where he says these simple things. He says, he has told you, O oh man, or humankind, th- listen to what God has said. He has told you what is good. Now, here we, 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 need, we need to stop here just for a moment because uh, when, when it says that he has told you what is good, this isn't about you know, pleasantness and pleasure. This is sort of an ethical understanding. What is the greatest flourishing? What is the way to find greatest good in life, the highest ultimate value thing? This is a, a, a question that, that has plagued philosophers' minds is what is ultimately good? And what this actually says to us today is you don't get to decide that. Jesus does. Right, God said, I have told you what is good because good flows from his nature. And so this is actually God saying, hey, people, human beings who, who sort of trying to figure this whole thing out but don't know what's I will show you what is good. I get to define that, that there is an objective, ultimate reality that flows from who I am, and I get to show you what these things You don't get to choose that. So as much as we like to sort of run against this and tell God that I can do what I want, he says, no, listen, I have said this. This is what is good. And then he goes on to say, so what does the Lord require of you? What does God demand of your life? If you are a human being, what does God expect? Well, to do justice, to love love, and to walk humbly with your God. What, what does God expect of us to do justice? To love his kindness, his mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. Justice, love, humility. Three things that, that I believe if we can begin to see in our life play it out, that we will get a grid for actually how to bring about the change and the improvement that, that you want. And as I said earlier, to actually become and make us human again. So where do we start? We start with justice, because that's what Micah started with. Do justice. Now in a modern world, in a modern world, we often think that we know what justice really is. Right? And, and we will probably say, if you, someone said, hey, what does it mean to be just? What, how do we go and do justice? Most of us would say, well, we've got to take care of, of the impoverished and the marginalized, speak up for those who don't have a voice, and, and be aware of this thing. It's a very kind of socialized justice, which, which is a part of it. It's an expression of it. But if you were to define a principle by one application, you actually miss out on the depth of what God is trying to teach us today. So we, we want to go a step beyond that to see the principle of justice and what that actually means for us. And, and in this way, justice is always a attached to what we would call righteousness or or, or right living in God's world, being aware of how God made the world to function for he he designs and and defines what is good and how we align our life with that. It means that we see things the way God sees them and then we act accordingly, that that we want to honor what God has put before us in all seasons, times with people and recognize how God sees this thing, this situation, this moment and act in accordance with God's will in that time. As one of my professors said, I think a very good and simple definition of justice is this, that I will treat all things in creation, everything, as it ought to be treated. That I will recognize the inherent value of that thing through the eyes of God and then treat it accordingly from people to things to situations to, 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 to my work to my marriages to institutions. That I, I, I see something as it is and then try to act in the best interest of that thing according to how God intended it to be. Which is, by the way, why at the very heart of the Christian understanding of justice always is care for the poor. Always. Because what we are doing is recognizing the inherent dignity of human beings as imago Dei, as image bearers of God, and trying to uphold that dignity and lift it up to do nothing that would diminish it and degrade it and cast it down, but to honor it and see there's a responsibility that is driven by their inherent worth as a human being. Like If you're in the room today and you don't follow Jesus and you believe that human beings are inherently valuable and worth fighting for, thank you, Jesus, for that. Because that didn't happen outside of what he did. Right? This is something that, that gets borrowed from, from Jesus into culture. And here's the thing. If that's you, that's awesome. I'm glad you think that. But you might want to discover why your underlying worldview doesn't allow you to think that unless you borrow it from, from Jesus. And I hope that you would continue to think that because we do believe it is right. But that comes from this space of recognizing there's something in a human being that's worth fighting for. And that's why as Christians, there is a lot of tension around this idea of, of societal social justice because although there's many theories, the heart is the same. How do I love somebody and honor somebody and take care of somebody who I recognize as an image bearer of God from the womb to the tomb that we honor life in what it is? And, and yes, we can work out the different kinds of systems and strategies and whatnot and fine, we can go do that and argue about it later. But the heart of it is that we look at people and say, hey, you have something worth fighting for. 
You have something that is worth being dignified around. This is why some people have asked me why, as a pastor, I, t- I tend to address things like pornography a lot from the stage. It's because of this issue. It's not just that it's a sexual issue. It's because it's a justice one, that we are seeing the image-bearing nature of this woman and degrading it to nothing more than a tool for my pleasure. Right? That doesn't honor what God made her to be, made them to be. And so for us, it's not just a lust thing. It's actually a justice thing that I would abuse the image-bearing nature of this woman for my own sexual pleasure to make her nothing more than an object. It's unjust. You aren't just selfish. You're, you're unjust, and that is an evil act against what God has made. Right? And if this is the case in justice in one area, well, then this is, begins to extend to all areas. This is what we begin to see. That's not just people, right? Because it's treating all things as they ought to be treated, which means that it extends to every part of my life. So if you're here today and you're married, right, there is a justice that goes towards your marriage to treat your marriage as it ought to be treated. This is why if you can get justice at your heart, you begin to see how a marriage actually gets better because I begin to realize the honor that is, de- that is demanded of me in that covenant, that, that she is the primary sort of relationship that I focus in on. That, that as we said here as a church before, that if I succeed at work but fail at home, I fail. Why? Because it takes priority over all other achievement is, is, the, is the health of my wife. That's what justice demands in my relationship. Or how about what it demands in my covenant, that I am monogamous and faithful and committed because that is the covenant that I made with her. Right? And although we live in a culture that maybe doesn't really do justice to this right now and actually tries to make it very easy and cool and, and, and nice to, to cheat on our spouses, like we got to stand and understand that justice demands that we do not do this. That justice says, my, my heart was given in the covenant to you forever. My eyes are only yours. And that's it, that we do justice actually to our marriages. Justice demands to treat things as they ought to be, what, what God has demanded of me that I love my spouse as Christ loved the church, that I, I love my spouse with a self-giving, self, um, self-putting-off self kind of affection and honor. Do you do justice to your spouse? Or how about at work? Are you an employer, right? Someone who, who hires people and maybe you're, you're an entrepreneur you're, you're, and you're the boss. What does justice demand of you at work? That you treat your, your, your people as they ought to be treated, as people, Right? Not just cogs in a machine that there's some other something inherently valuable about them that that's matters more right, than profit margins. That you have a responsibility by justice to treat human beings not as objects of serving your mission, but actually as people worth caring for, giving purpose in life, improving and loving, even a space of work. Or if you're someone who's an employee and you actually work, do you uphold what you promised your boss that you would do? Or do you steal time? Steal resource, joke off, and don't actually do what you committed. Because that is a justice issue. You aren't just lazy, you're unjust. It's a problem if we are not going to see that, that, that the covenant I made, the promise that I made to work and to perform actually matters. Or how about school? How about school? You're a student? Right? If you're in a season where God has allowed you to learn and you don't give your, your heart to learn your craft and grow and understand, then it's not just that you don't like school. You're actually being unjust to the system. That you're supposed to learn and grow and be in that space to treat it as it ought to be treated. See, justice begins to demand so much of us because we begin to look at all things now through a different lens. What did God intend and what did God want and how do I live according to that pattern? It, it actually increases the demands on my life. It makes my standard of living and the kind of moral and ethical standard higher. My generosity has to go higher. My thought light has to go higher. My awareness has to go higher. But the, the demands of my time, my energy, my money goes up, not down. When I begin to see what Jesus wants out of my life, it actually demands more of me, more sacrifice, more out of my life. It's actually easier. It's easier to do what culture does and talk about justice without doing it. See, as a culture, we love the idea of justice because it sounds really good. I care for people. But the problem is justice extends to every single scope and space of my life. Every single one. It demands much of me. All of me, in fact, you could say. Because to do justice is to walk in God's world the way he wanted it to. So the question really becomes then, then how do we get this justice? Because the problem is if we just say, go and be just, right, some of us will try and fail. Some of us will, will, will try to succeed and just make it more about a prideful thing. Look how just I am. And so either it's unsustainable or prideful. That's the problem with justice in and of itself. It has to be motivated by, by something deeper. And luckily for us, we have it in, in here. Because Micah goes on to say what? And we need to love, love. Do justice and, and, and love the said 
of God. And this is hard to sort of put into, into, into English words because it's one word in, in the Hebrew that encapsulates so much of who God is and how he loves us. It's his covenantal, never stopping, always pursuing, ever-present love given on the promise of who he is, not on the performance of his people. That this is a love that, that lives outside of our, our ability to earn it or deserve it. It's a love that, that sort of is bathed in grace and affection and mercy in spite of us, knowing we're going to fail all the time, but yet loving us as deep as if we were perfect. It's a love that, that, that looks at us and for anyone caught in its affection, pursues flourishing on its behalf. It's covenanted, which means it's faithful to the very last breath that I breathe. It's a love that, 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 that looks at, uh, at us, and, and this is where justice happens because it wants to bring about the best flourishing for this thing that it, that, 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 that it loves. And so justice begins to flow from this love out of it. The heart of a just person is, is love. And, and the problem is, is that this love is demanded of you and I, that we are to love it. And you might be thinking, Mike, that sounds great. It sounds wonderful, idealistic, you know, that God loves us this way. But, but then let's be honest. If when, we, when we sort of begin to peel back the layers of Scripture and read about this love that we talk about, how many of us often think, well, yeah, that's just too good to be true? It sounds so, so ideal. It sounds so wonderful. But I've never experienced that kind of love in my life. It's sort of otherworldly. It's inhuman. That that's not how we operate. And, and, the, and the thing is, you're 100% right. It is otherworldly. It's in. It's not human. It actually comes from the very heart of God himself. In fact, John writes us in one of his letters that, that God is, is love. That that is the nature and the essence of God. That this love that we talk about actually comes from his very heart. That if we have any kind of inkling of love as human beings, it's a mere shadow and resemblance of what God actually is in himself. That this is where it bursts from. But the problem with this love is it's a love that always is active. It always multiplies itself. And so you can't just have this love without going to do this love, which is why justice is driven from this place of love. Because if you have the love of God, you must Act. That's why John also writes that, that we love as Christians. Why? Because we first have been loved. Did you know that you were made, formed, and crafted simply for the sake of knowing this love? This is the relational bend of our God. When Jesus talked about right, the purpose of life, ultimately, what are the two greatest commandments? It was to what? To love God and then to what? Love people, do justice. That these things are, are always interconnected. That if you want to discover truly what, what humanity looks like in its best form, is to be loving God and then from that place loving people. That's what God has called us to be in. That this love sort of encapsulates us. And so the question really, 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 really becomes, what does it mean then for us practically to love love? Right? Because it's not just some, you know, you know this, this sort of kind of like, 14-year-old infatuation, right, where everyone just loves love. And I just want to be in a boyfriend and have all this stuff. I hope my live never goes through that. I know she will. It's inevitable. But hopefully before then I can teach her that's not what it's about. Um, not like that was really aggressive. But it's, it's the idea, wiping away the idea. Not, not, not all the boys. Get out of it. Um, not until she's 30. We talk about that. 30 is a good age. Um, she's cute. Weston, we'll talk about him later. Where was I at? Anyways, not like that kind of love. What, what does it mean to, to love love? And it, mean, it means this, that we live in, for, and from the love of God. See, if you remember in our Apprentice series, not to try to make too many connections here, but, but Jesus said what? That we are to abide in him, which was what? To abide in his word and abide in his love. That we actually live from, make our home in the love of God. That we live in it and we receive it. We live for it as our mission and we live from it. That it identifies who we are. That the love of God, this, all, this altogether committed, faithful love in spite of me, even above my issues and because and, and taking over my issues, this love begins to identify how I operate. That I am a child of the Most High. God, loved by my Father, accepted by grace, that I am this, that I don't need to live on my comparison to you or your acceptance of me because I've already get, got that in Jesus. And so I live in this place of strength, this place of, of other centeredness. Because I don't know if you've figured this out yet, but this love is very other centered. It always has an expression outward. Here's the problem. Can we be honest in church? Are we allowed to be honest? You're selfish. I know it's quiet because no one wants to admit it, but like, it's true, right? We are. We are selfish people, which means we are predisposed not to love. Right? The part of the brokenness of sin in our hearts is that we don't actually want to love well. And the thing is, we, we sort of recognize that, but we don't do much about it because culture actually makes this very hard. It sort of rides the line between this thing of, of sort of self-centeredness and self-care because we'll say dumb things all the time. 
I don't know if you heard this one before, but like, I can't love somebody till I love myself. That's a load of crap. I'm sorry, right? We, 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 it goes around all the time, but we, we have this idea that, like, hear me, if the only time you can love somebody is if you love yourself, then, then, then you're going to wait a long time. Why? Because you already love yourself so much, and so that's your excuse. It's never going to happen. And you might be thinking, no, I don't love myself. Yes, you do. You want your well-being to grow, right? In fact, some of us actually don't really like ourselves as we currently are because we love the essence of who we are and want us to get better. That actually the, the self-pity we have comes from deep self-centeredness in our heart. We are so self-focused and self-driven that that's what we want to create and, and curate and grow that we have no time for other people. That if we, if we don't do the hard work of understanding that, that, that caring for self, doing the justice to me, because hear me today, a healthy you is the best you. Don't get that twisted. But to say that I have to love everything about me and love myself first, that is not love. That's selfishness. It will never be what you think it is. And some of us live in this all the time. Well, I'll love them tomorrow. No, you won't. Can we be honest? You won't. It's not going to happen. Right? Love always demands of us right now. And hear me today. As I said, a healthy you is the best you, and so you should be taking care of yourself in some ways. Self-interest is not self-centeredness, right? Does everyone brush their teeth, hopefully, right? Because you don't want your teeth to fall out, right? You want to take care of, of the teeth, right? No one's going to think you're selfish for doing that, right? It's a self-interested thing, but it's a good thing, right? So, yeah, we need to get some rest. We need, we need to make sure maybe some of us need to see some counseling, take some time to be in community, make sure that we're getting healthy. But you know what? A healthy you doesn't start until you actually get soaked by said. See, that's the thing. Do all that you want. Go on all your retreats. But if you're doing things outside of the space of, of the love of God that forms your soul and changes you and melts who you are and reshapes you into his image, then all you're going to do is perpetuate brokenness with some new lingo and cool thoughts. And that's not awesome because you get more confused. Right, so for us, what we begin to see is this is actually the claim, the very heart of the Christian faith. That if you can come to Jesus, he'll wash you and, and take over you in your love, and then you'll be enlisted in this, in this life of, of being changed to look like him. That, that we are not a church, we are not a faith that chases heaven down one day. Right? It's that heaven has come now that Jesus begins to move in this space right in this moment. That the love begins to move and change us. We're, we're not awaiting some day. It's coming. It's right here. And that's what love begins to do. It frees us up from some of this stuff. Now, some of us, right, when we talk about love, you know, we think it's a little bit, you know, too emotional. Right? It's a little soft, right? The strongest people know how to love well because the expression of that love becomes justice. So the deepest ones of love are usually the most ethically strong ones. So for us to say that we are bathed in and walking and live in the love of God is to admit that we actually want to be strong in our justice. Take care of those who are weak. Right? The definition for us of strength, of life, becomes these things, nothing else. So we are, are bathed in the love of God. We're invited to this thing that, that I don't know about you, but I'm pretty sure your marriage could need more of this love. Would you not argue that that would be a good thing? That your friendships could need some of this love, that they go deeper. That this love that, that avoids comparison and robs bitterness, that, that this love that, that chases away our need for affirmation could actually begin to breed some, some very healthy relationships? I think so. The question now becomes, well, how do we enter into that love? I'm glad you asked. Micah has an answer. To walk humbly with your God to walk humbly with your God, to do justice, which comes from the heart of love, which we get into by walking humbly with our God. To walk in Scripture is always this metaphor for life, to do life, to go about life with God, that he becomes the leader, he becomes the one who directs our past. We will sort of walk in his direction. That's sort of the goal for us. And, and to walk humbly is to be in his proximity, to be with him in, in, in his presence, in fact, which connects back to the disciplines, to be in, in the word of God, to be in prayer, community, and faithfulness, and, and in fellowship, that we are there together as he forms our soul, that we allow God to direct us. Now, here's the problem. Here's the problem. Here's the problem. Is that he didn't say, Go walk confidently with your God. He didn't say, go walk boldly with your God. He said, come walk humbly with your God. 
Why? Why? Because a humble heart sees things that a prideful heart never will. It begins in this very simple admission. And and, and this might be something that's going to just make your heart feel so joyful. It's knowing that you're weak. It's taking the facade of strength off and saying, God, I'm not you. I don't actually know how to do everything all that awesome. I can admit that there's some issues in my heart that I try to do some things and I get it wrong. God, like I need, I need, some, I need some help. God, I, I need some direction given because I'm trying to love my wife, but it's just not going the way that I think it should. God, I'm, I'm trying to be a good parent, but, but those kids, man, they, they, they get on my, on my nerves. I'm trying to be a faithful person at work and at school. I'm, I'm trying to be the, the just person you want me to be. God, I'm trying to live this life, but God, I actually can't. I need, I need some help. I seem to always struggle and, and fall. Humility puts me in the place where I can actually go and depend on God, that he can fill the gap of my inability with his, his grace. But the prideful heart says, God, I got this. I don't need no help. I'm just going to be who you want me to be. The problem is you're a fool if that's you. The Bible actually says that the fool says that there is no God. That he doesn't acknowledge the way that you should walk in life. And the problem with a lot of our hearts is that we don't like admitting weakness because it makes us feel weak. And who wants to be seen that way? But the humble heart recognizes that, God, uh, you made the world. You sort of formed this whole thing out. I'm just one little speck in it, but yet you love me so much and you care and you give me your word to guide me. So maybe there's something in following you, in submitting to you that leads me to life. Humility brings me to this place that actually, hear me today, does justice to myself. Because it recognizes what? My inherent weakness and my strengths. It recognizes my brokenness. It recognizes my need and says, God, I need to treat this thing right here as it ought to be treated, which means I need some help. Humility puts me in the place where I actually get to be offered up before God and allow his power to to, to actually move in my life and give me the ability to live what he wants me to live. See, Jesus says that when the Spirit comes, he's supposed to come and give us and lead us in righteousness, lead us in in, in life and the truth, actually empower us to go and do what he wanted us to do. That Jesus, he's not leaving us unempowered to go and actually achieve all this stuff. The problem is the prideful heart says, God, you know, I got this. I don't know if I need you. I think I got this life figured out. I know it's falling apart underneath the surface, but I can't let my friends see that. I, I know that I cry at night and I am worried about life, but like, God, I, I'm pretty good about this. I, I, got, I got this figured out. I think I can figure, God, I know, I know that, that, that you sort of have some plans for my life, but I'm pretty sure that if I do it my way, it's going to get there better. And, and I would rather have my lust and my greed than have your joy. So I'm just going to live in that space. And, and I know it, it seems that, God, that, that, that God might be weak, but actually it's not weakness. I'm just going to cover it over with, with, with anger and ignorance and just pretend like I'm good. Right? And I know that might sound like a caricature, but some of us know that voice so well. I do. Can we be real? Right? When I begin thinking that this is all about Mike, what I think, what I want, I begin to, to sort of push God out. But the problem is humility actually invites me to freedom. I want you to see this because freedom is actually having a direction to walk in and not no one telling me what to do. Right? God, he moves in and says, if you walk humbly with me, I will give you the steps to take. And this is where you need to walk in. So for us as Christians, we come and we actually submit and say, God, I got some issues. You can fix them. I got some insecurities. You can take care of them. I got some brokenness. I, I got some struggle. God, I know you can lead me. Because here's the thing. All of us in the room today have a leader, have, have someone who's directing our path. The question becomes, are they worth following? For some of us, it's actually ourself. My thoughts, my feelings, my wants, my desires, my impulses, I just go wherever they take me, right? That's dumb. Can we be honest, right? We don't always make good decisions based on impulse and desire and feeling, right? We're often tricked and tempted into things that shouldn't be, uh, that aren't given to, to, to real life. Some of us, it's, it's philosophies and different ideas. But the thing about, about Jesus, he comes in and says, if you would follow me, the only one who came and lived the life that, that we live, died the death that we deserve, and said, if you follow me, you're actually going to get life and joy and fullness forevermore. That is the offer. That you don't have to walk this alone, chase some idea. I will be right with you. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Come and do life with me. Apprentice this thing out. I'm, I'm present. So the question becomes, are we willing to humbly then walk with God, saying, God, I don't got all the answers, but maybe you do. And let me just figure this thing out with you. The question then becomes, well, well, Mike, how do I start walking humbly with God? Well, I'm glad you asked that question as well. 
Because it's interesting, because Mike actually gives us a, a, a interesting pattern. Because what you begin to do is you start back at justice. And you say, God, um, you require justice of me, but I, I, I can't do it. I don't live perfect justice. I'm selfish at times. I'm greedy. I'm lustful. I'm prideful. God, I can't, I can't live that out. He says, I know. So I love you. I gave you Jesus, who's called our righteousness. The love begins to wash over you, which invites me to what? Walk humbly with my God. Say, God, if that's what you're willing to do for me on that day, I'm willing to trust you with every step that I have. Then what does he do? And that process reminds you of his love, which empowers you to what? Go do justice. And then you remember that I can't do justice, so now I fall back on his love. Come admit my weakness, and I start walking with him humbly. Then he reminds me of his love again, so I go empowered and do justice. Then I recognize, hey, I, sp- I screwed up again. Oh, I'm going to come back on his love. Begin walking with him humbly. Then he's going to remind me of his love. I'm going to empower him to go do justice. And begin to see this pattern begin working out, that actually it's the justice that, we are, that, that is demanded that drives me to the place of humility, that allows me to live fully in his love, which empowers me then to do justice. If you want to know the love of God, start with your inability to actually be enough. And then you get the love. This is how God destroys religion in your heart. This is what these people didn't understand. They thought if I can come, do a bunch of good stuff, make up for all my issues, then God will love me. The issue is this. The grace of God has no bearing on your worthiness of it. Nothing. You can't earn it. It's either Jesus did it all or he did nothing. And for us as Christians, what is our message? What is the gospel? That we have good news, that Jesus did all that I could not do, invites me to receive this love of heaven, invites me to walk in the submission, to be an become an apprentice of God, to have my righteousness filled up by his perfection, that my gap is filled with the grace of God, that my inability and my weakness are, are okay when God gets a hold of them, that there is something in me that allows God to move in my life. And it's this thing called humility today. So if you're here today, I want you to understand this. God requires of you justice requires that's a strong word requires human being if you're a human in the room today this is what God wants of your life to honor humans as they should be to honor life as it should be to walk in humility with your God and when we don't do that what do we put ourselves at odds with his justice to rid the world of sin and evil so what do we need to do lean on love again this is the invitation You want to live with justice, live from the love of God, which comes with humbly walking before him. Today, the good news, the gospel of Christianity, which we need to remember as Christians all the time, is that yes, we are called to live as just people, knowing that the space between what I need to be and where I am is wide, but his love is wider. You want to know what it means to be truly human? It means this. I have a leader. His name is Jesus. I have a love that's given to me on a cross, and I go and do justice because he has loved me so much. Everything else falls into this space. Everything else falls here. The question becomes for you today, are you doing justice? Do you care about it? Here's the answer, no, not enough. Can I admit that? I'm your pastor. I do not do it enough. The question is this, do, do, do you love the love of God? Do you, are you immersed in it? Do you flow in it? Does it do everything to your soul? Does it awaken you in the morning? Does it, does it, does it form you in who you are? And are you apprentice to Jesus? Saying, teach me and lead me. Where are you at? What does the Lord require of you today? To do justice. To love love. And to walk humbly with your God. Would you stand with me? I want to pray for us.